Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, quiet within us any voice but your own, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before we read the scripture this morning, I invite you to use your imagination for a moment. Imagine that this is all you have in your pantry. Imagine that this is all that you have at home in your kitchen. This little bit of oil and this little bit of flour. You have no milk, you have no eggs, you have no meat, there is no vegetables or fruit. Just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. Today's scripture lesson this morning tells the story of a mother and her son for whom this is their reality. Hear now these words from 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 17th chapter of 1 Kings introduces us to the prophet Elijah, God's servant who enters the story as King Ahab and his wife Jezebel's worship of Baal lures Israel's singular devotion away from worshiping the God of Israel. Ahab not only tolerates the idolatry of his foreign wife, like the kings that had come before him, but he pushes the envelope just a little further. Ahab becomes an active worshiper of Baal himself, even establishing a temple and an altar in the capital city dedicated to Baal. Elijah enters, and in time, subsequently, his uh, protege, Elisha, and they go about the work of mediating the covenant between Israel and God. They continually call Israel back to the covenant established between God and Israel and to what their faithful participation does and does not include. Something to be attentive to in your reading as you read through first and then second Kings is that though Israel as a people and nation are disobedient and continue to wander away from the life their covenant with God calls them toward, God persistently and insistently will not let them go. Their choices to break covenant with God carries consequence, and yet God remains committed to the covenant and does not abandon them. 
Elijah's first act, which comes right before the narrative that we just read, announces a drought, saying to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. This declaration and the subsequent actualization of a drought in the land is a direct challenge that Baal is the sovereign God who rules over rain and storm. A sustained drought creates many devastating issues within a community. There's the lack of available drinking water And of course, if there's a lack of available drinking water, then there also is a lack of water that helps to nourish the crops. And so after some time, food becomes problematic. There is an image that offers a collage of images which help to tell the story of Elijah. And that central primary image tells the story that occurs right before today's story, in which the Lord tells Elijah in the midst of this drought to go to a particular place uh, near a wadi, which is sort of like a river's uh, tributary, where he would be provided with water, and that there in that place that ravens would come and would provide him with bread and meat morning and evening. Due to the length of the drought, though, eventually that place dries up. And when it did, the Lord commands Elijah to go to Zarephath, to a widow's house. Geographically, this removes Elijah from Israel's territory. Zarephath is a region in Sidon which was Phoenician territory, a bit north of Israel's borders. Elijah must move on because this water source has dried up. Many Bibles translations, including the one from the NRSV that we read this morning, states that the Lord has commanded the widow to feed Elijah, implying that God has laid some groundwork with the widow herself. When I hear, Elijah, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. In that, I hear, I've done a little bit of work with this widow, and you will be well received. However, there's nothing with how the narrative unfolds that actually suggests that that's the case. There is no recorded conversation between God or one of God's messengers and this widow. It is only through what is told to Elijah that we know what God intends. Robert Atler offers a translation and a commentary, and in it he has God saying to Elijah, I have charged, I have charged a widow, rather than I have commanded a widow. Commenting that God has not actually spoken to the widow, but rather has cast her into a particular role. Which then suggests that there's a little bit of improvisation that happens here, as this woman is cast for a role that she is completely unaware she's up for. The widow's initial refusal of Elijah's request, I think, supports this interpretation. I think that this widow's initial denial and pushback on Elijah is not unfaithfulness to someone who's been commanded by God to do something particular, but rather it is a woman who is trying her very best in a particular moment. Her response is human, it is pragmatic, and it is full of care for her and for her son. 
Due to the circumstances of the drought, this woman doesn't have enough to provide for herself or her son. She is preparing the comfort of a familiar ritual, a meal, if you can even call this a meal. She is preparing a final act of love and compassion for her son as she prepares for them to die. And it's in this moment, this moment, that Elijah shows up on the scene and asks her to share her last meager meal with him, which quite frankly is a rather bold and audacious request. Most of the time we find ourselves giving and sharing from a place of abundance. Our giving is rarely, if ever, sacrificial. Elijah says to the woman who is asked to give that which she does not have, Elijah says to her, speaking words that God's messengers say over and over again throughout scripture, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Today it almost seems commonplace and even socially acceptable that we play on one another's fears. That it's okay to see what someone is afraid of and to push on it a little bit in order to get what we want or what we would have them do. If that's hard for us to see in our own lives, I think that we can relatively easily see it within the world around us as we watch current events unfold. One of the things that I hear this text saying and that I hear scripture saying to us over and over again is that God's activity in the world does not manipulate us based on our fears. God and God's messengers may challenge us and call us to do hard things, things that we ourselves may not feel capable of due to our understanding of our gifts or our resources or a particular context. And yet God will not coerce us using our fear. God says over and over again throughout scripture, do not be afraid. Moses, do not be afraid, for I will provide you with the words to speak. Mary, do not be afraid, for God has found favor with you. Widow of Zarephath, do not be afraid. I will provide you with an unending supply of oil and flour. People of God, do not be afraid, for I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you. A common question for people of faith, one that pastors often hear is, how do I know when it is God speaking to me? We struggle as pastors with this question all the time too. But this question has arisen with greater frequency, I have found, since we've begun this journey through the Bible together. And I think in part it's because we've been journeying through these Old Testament narratives in which it seems as we read them, God speaks very clearly to characters within Scripture. And that somehow we ourselves don't have that exact experience of God coming and saying, it'd be nice, it'd be really nice if in the unfolding narrative of our own lives, we could hear a voice that would say, Nicole, God says, 
Bill, God says. But in my experience, it's only in reflection, in hindsight, that we are able to look back and say about a particular time or situation, and God said to me, or if we're not able to say, and God said to me, sometimes we'll be able to say, you know, God spoke to me through this community when I was going through, or I heard from this person, God say to me, God support me, God encourage me. So how are we to know if God is calling us to a particular role? I think that through this story, one avenue of discernment is, do you hear the still small voice from within yourself saying to you, do not be afraid? Or do you hear the community around you saying to you, do not be afraid? Is there someone in your life who is saying to you, do not be afraid? That may very well be the voice of God saying to you, do not be afraid. The widow of Zarephath gives that which she does not have to spare. And in her giving, she is blessed and the meager amount of oil and flour does not run out. It is nothing short of a miracle. It is a miracle. In a world in which the future is unknown to us, as it has always been, and yet with which we live in a time of such tension and uncertainty that perhaps that unknowing creates a greater depth of fear for us. Hear the words that God says over and over, do not be afraid. In a world in which costs are rising, and everyone's resources are beginning to feel tighter, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to give generously. Do not be afraid to act compassionately. Do not be afraid to love God and to love others with your whole self. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For God will strengthen you, God will help you, and God will uphold you. May all glory, honor, and praise be to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Faithful and loving God, we give you thanks for your word to us, a word in which you are ever present, a word in which you continually uphold your covenant with your people, providing for us beyond our wildest imaginations. There is so much, O oh God, that is uncertain. There is so much, O oh God, that is broken. There is so much pain and hurt, violence and war that is present in this world. But these are not the only things that are present. Also present are your good works, are the gifts of your creation, are strangers and friends who reach out to one another in love and support and compassion and care. Help us, O oh God, to be your church in this time and in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.